Uh, okay, so, so, so we made this executive decision to, to, we don't have the snappy Australian accent, but we made this executive decision to, to switch into English so that we can play into what Geraldine and Anna uh, are doing later on, because they have, uh, of course, the rest of the day with their exciting uh, framework <laughs> that all of you are going to work with. So, so uh, therefore, two Norwegians speaking English it is. in Oslo. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, Jørgensen Pedersen, we, we, we hide, or we do not hide, we, we work together uh, under, the, under the name of Va, I Problema, what's the problem? We were working with problem formulation for, for many years together. I think we were working now almost 10 years together, haven't we? Haven't we? Yeah, everyone except my wife thinks we're married. <laughs> uh, his wife thinks we're married also. Of course they do, uh, and we 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 call and and the children we don't we don't have to ask the children who's calling because they know it's it's us. So so we 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 work with the sustainability, responsibility, business model, innovation. That's like the the key words, the headings here. And it used to be kind of lonely in many ways, didn't it? No, yeah, it did. We used to call ourselves. We we said that we came from the Department of Damaged Goods from from our business school. Uh, but we think that the, the damaged goods are coming back into style. So, so we see now, today is all about the future, right? This is what Geraldine and, and Anne are going to, to walk us through later on. We're going to talk about what are the solutions of the future, like Michael talked about earlier, like Stian told us about what Oslo are doing. Uh, and we're talking about the future, and, and the future is finally happening. Because for a very long time, the future didn't happen. But now it's finally happening. Mm. And that's what we do work on. We do, we do. Uh, we wrote a book uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Responsible and Profitable. It's, it's uh, been translated now into English, and, and we use it on, on, on a master course at, at the Norwegian School of Economics and also in Lillehammer. Uh, we use it also in um, a new course that we're having, or it's not a new course anymore, it's a finished course mm -hmm. uh, on, 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 in, on NHH, uh, I'm going to try that again, <laughs> try that again, NHH Executive. Mm -hmm. uh, 40 to 50 uh, business leaders have followed this online course this, this semester talking about this issue. Mm -hmm. And um, again, the theme, uh, business, uh, sustainable business models. Yeah, so you see that the top management is, is, is really getting engaged in this now. We see this very clearly. By the way, if you want to find the two narcissists in the room, just look for the guy standing in front of, the, of a big picture of themselves. Uh, but this is a picture, and it's also a newspaper clipping about our course, which tabloid, uh, in a tabloid manner, says how to make money on the problems of the earth. And that's, in some sense, what, I mean, it's part of what we're talking about today. It's part of the, the message that we have in our little presentation that we're going to try to make a bit shorter uh, than the time we had allotted. Uh, so without further ado, we start with our messages, should we? Mm -hmm. I think. Or did you have anything mm -hmm. to add? Uh, so we have basically two messages uh, today, and, and uh, uh, this is the short version. The, the longer version is that sustainability and profitability are possible to align. They're possible to combine. Uh, they, you, you can be sustainable and profitable at the same time, and not only that, but there are unique opportunities for competitive advantage and thereby for profitability in addressing sustainability concerns. That's our first message. Our second message is that it's damn hard. So it's possible, but it's damn hard. And this is what Vibeke just talked about. It requires, across the board, a massive change in business models. It requires that we change the ways that business operates uh, and the ways that, that uh, businesses try to target customer needs. And we're going to talk about the two main ways in which uh, companies can do this. Because we, we separate this out into two categories of business models that we're going to talk more about. The journey, this part of the journey, or if we go back like, say, seven, eight, nine years when we started our research on this, uh, we had a tendency to talk a lot about responsibility uh, and the book, Responsible and Profitable. And when we wrote the book, we decided to take those two because we also teach strategy, we're interested in, in strategy, and it's kind of easy to be profitable, and it's kind of easy to be responsible. Um, but, but how be both responsible and uh, profitable at the same time. That's, that's where it, it becomes difficult. It's possible. Uh, and, and we started our, our journey some years ago, and, and it, this, this field has developed uh, so, so quickly. We see now, we can hear it just today from Stian, from, from, from Michael and uh, Vibeke, 
you can you can hear hear the words now. There's circular economy. People are talking about that as it's kind of normal. Even in the politicians said so. You know, mm -hmm. uh, sustainability, uh, business models. So it's starting to evolve. Uh, and what we see, uh, there's a lot of examples of technologies because uh, the transition from a technology and invention into an innovation. That's the hard part. Uh, this is from the the slum uh, or the favela in in Brazil. It's uh, kinetic football field uh, where the energy uh, of, the, of the lights here comes from uh, the, the, the children playing soccer or football uh, on the field. I would love to have this technology in my house. My two young girls would power our whole neighborhood mm -hmm. for, for years and years. This is a technology, I think, developed by Shell, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, uh, yet to be uh, transformed into to, uh, a business model as far as I know, but a, a very fascinating technology for, for this purpose. Another example, uh, excuse me, is, is uh, solar panels here in the road and also in the pavements. Uh, it's just starting to exist, but how, how to build successful business models around them? Mm. Right, so the technology is there, but what kind of business model is needed to make this, make this click for the individual firm, right? That's the question. So what's next? Kitchen of the future. Uh, IKEA, uh, smart kitchen. It's a little bit early. This is more like a vision. Uh, I think they have a kitchen now that is more ready to use. But here they're just pointing out some uh, use of energy, uh, how you can you can make food, uh, how you can uh, see w what kind of um, oh, all the things that are inside the food. The kitchen tells you uh, what you need to eat that day in order to stay healthy, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. So. There's some, some ideas about the future, and that's what Anne and Geraldine, Dean, Dean I'm sorry, uh, are going to learn us more about later on, how to visualize a future, how, how is the future going to be, and how, how then to tr transform uh, the business, but also the society. Yeah, and it's clear that, I mean, this is a picture that, that clearly can be, can be uh, you can wrap a business model around this, right? So, so this can solve many problems. It, it maps up with what Michael talked about earlier, how to use a lot of information and how to use knowledge into these kinds of systems uh, to help us make better choices, right? And even to make choices for us, which is a good thing in this day and age. This is Bill Gates. I never thought I'd say this sentence out loud, but this is Bill Gates drinking poo. Uh, not quite poo, but it was. This was sewer cloak in Norwegian until minutes before he drank it, right? So, so this, this doesn't sit quite right, but it can be a solution for, for a massive problem that, that Michael already talked about today. We're running out of water. We're running out of all sorts of water, including drinking water. And now we have the technology here to actually turn sewer back into water, back into drinking water even. Uh, and of course, what's the, biggest, what's the biggest obstacle for that business model, you think? I think the biggest obstacle for that business model is right here. It's right here. I remember when I was in the Navy, I had to uh, put a syringe into my, own, uh, into my own foot and kind of inject salty water, like a practice. And it took me like 30 minutes to get my hand from here and down here. I think I would use four hours getting that glass from here and, and up to my mouth, right? So, but if we can change consumer thinking, if we can change consumer habits into to kind of the willingness to consume things we, we wouldn't have thought we would, uh, then we can really uh, see uh, big opportunities in these kinds of, of technologies as well. This is uh, the wind, wind ship. Uh, it's, it's got a lot of attention. Uh, it's not finished yet, it's just an idea, but how to use headwind in, in order to get energy uh, for, for, for the ship. Uh, I'm not going to go into details, I don't know a whole lot about the details, uh, but still, it's a new way of thinking about how uh, to, to provide energy for, for, for ships. It's an invention, but how again, how to build those successful uh, business models uh, around it. This is this is a rave the rave party. You rave party yesterday, yesterday. I was here. Yes, you were playing. No, I guess. Th this is an algae, and and we. Uh, I was recently talking to the CEO of of an experimental firm that works with. Basically, what they do is they they capture massive amounts of CO2, and then they make glass pipes in rooms filled with with uh, lighting lightning, and then they they send the CO2 into into the pipes where there are algae that produce a very omega-3-rich omega uh, food for fish. 
So this is financed by fish farm companies alongside academic institutions, universities, and so on. So basically, you're solving two problems at once, right? One, you're getting rid of massive amounts of CO2. So now we have this technology, we can capture CO2, but what do we do with it? Can we bury it in Sveinung's yard? Or we have to do something with it. And they turn it into productive use. They ship it back into to water, produce algae that has, has uh, omega-3 that is richer than regular fish food, so the fish in fish farms get even better food. Right? So we're solving two problems at once, basically. And I want to say one more thing about that, because I think the beautiful thing about this business model is that, because there's already a business model around this, and the beautiful thing is that the firms that are doing this, they are actually getting this CO2 for free. Now, that's wonderful. I mean, all of the firms here would love to get their input factors for free, right? Uh, raise your hand if you wouldn't. Uh, but the other thing about this, the next step, I mean, we will see firms wanting to get rid of their CO2. When we start pricing this accordingly, firms will be willing to pay you to take their CO2. So if you are a firm that can capture CO2 and bring it into your own production, you can have a customer on that side of the value chain, and you can have a customer on the other side, the fish farming companies who actually buy the algae that they can use for fish farming. So this is one example, and now we're getting to the point, I think. This is one example of how can you wrap a beautifully designed business model around a technology, around a consumer need, around some sort of trend. I'm going to talk a lot about trends today. Uh, that, that, are, that are happening and that will be happening much stronger in the future. We're not going to talk too much about this uh, slide. Michael talked us through, uh, through it and also Stian was uh, mentioning it, uh, the sharing economy. Uh, we, we hear about the millennials, uh, this new generation. Stian said he was not a part of it, so uh, you're, you're perhaps, I'm, I'm, I'm not. Uh, we don't have to own the things anymore. We, 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 we need to, to own the right to, to use it. So if I need a Ferrari for my date, I'll, I get a Ferrari for my date. I, I don't have to own it. I can own uh, the ability to, to, to get it. And again, uh, there are lots of possibilities here. Uh, but how how to build successful uh, business models around them. Yeah, and, and Vibeke said something that I think is very important, which is that a lot of these problems are so massive that, that we need to find solutions that go across organizations. So thinking that we will find the solutions to these massive problems inside single organizations, so let's close ourselves in here and not tell anyone what we're doing, I think, <clears throat> I think is a very wrong strategy. I think that firms much more in five years than five years ago and 10 years into the future, 15 years into the future, I think we're going to see a lot more collaboration, a, a much, much more of a collaborative economy mm -hmm. where, where firms will have to engage to make better systems, basically. Communities of organizations, so to speak. That's perhaps why it's so hard as well to do it. I mean, we said it's even damn hard to do it. Uh, is to stop thinking about yourself or your unit, the business as a unit. You have to talk about, understand this problem as a systematic problem, complex problem, problems, then, and also problems that you have to solve not only alone, but together with also your competitors, mm. uh, which is a shift of mentality uh, in business. Mm. This kind of wraps it up, doesn't it, Lars Jakob? Yeah, tell me, tell yes. me what I'm looking at. You no, know, we, we, we heard it earlier from, from IBM, the big, 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 big data, you know, uh, as, a, as a researcher, you know, you're, you dribble, <laughs> is that what you call it, secret, yeah, just, yeah. just listening to all the big data that are out there, you, you know, you we want to have the data. We want to have the facts. We want to. We want to be able to say, well, here, 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 here it is. Here, you need to do so and so because because so and so. But, but this is a picture of a city. Uh, talking about smart cities. We talked about big data. We, we're now starting to get more knowledge about the consumers. We, we get more knowledge about how we travel, where we work, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because of the the possibility to have sensor and the internet of of everything, uh, interwoven. So so all information. We're going to talk about all these trends later on, and you're going to introduce them as well. Uh, with, with, with the, the, with everything is, is, is open, and you, and you got the information. So what we see here is, is more like a vision. We, we learn now it's maybe possible to do that in Oslo. It's impossible to do in, in other cities. But what we see here is, is uh, energy coming from, from, uh, from alternative sources, even that, either that is wind or if it's solar. We have smart houses, we have smart buildings, we have electrical buses, we have, we have um, sh car sharing. What did you call it in English? It was, it was zip, car. zip car. 
She asked me earlier this morning, do we have any zip car models in Norway? And I was like, mm, I'm not quite sure. Are you, are you trying to be polite now? Uh, but but uh, I understood that was kind of a, uh, you know... Uh, I have two, I, in digression, I have two uh -huh. master students who've been doing a, a study this semester on uh, Norwegians' willingness to share their car through car sharing services, right? Because we, we might be willing to take someone else's car. I, I can live with that. But have someone else come to my place and take my car. I mean, I'm a country boy. Uh, it doesn't sound right, you know. Uh, so, so what they find, basically, they find a lot, of, a lot of interesting things, but what they basically find in one sentence is that, that uh, Norwegians are negative. <laughs> They're negative to this. Uh, they, they, uh, some, some groups of, of, uh, of consumers are slightly le less negative. I could tell you a lot about the underlying things, but it, it, it kind of goes, goes from negative to slightly less negative. Right, so that's the spam. So that means that we have quite a bit of movement before we end up in the kind of thinking that we know from Copenhagen, the kind of thinking we know from Berlin, I'm sure the same thing in London, where, where these kinds of, of, of processes have gone, come so, so much further. So I think in Norway, uh, we, we are lagging a bit behind in this mindset that can enable the sharing economy. So this will be interesting to follow. Digression over. That was a nice digression. Uh, I don't have to, to, to talk about all the picture. We, we borrowed this from, from Tripper. Is, are there anyone here from Scandinavian Design Group, SDG? I think they're part of the network at least, but yes. I don't see any uh, familiar we, faces. We, we were there some weeks ago and working with, with, uh, with the partners there. Uh, it's Green Nudge and Scandinavian Design Group working together with uh, lots of Nor Norwegian organizations all through the, the value chain. And, uh, and, and they're, they're trying to find solutions then uh, between competitors horizontally and vertically in, in the value chain. Um, so uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that. No, but I think you, you probably heard about the, the first concrete project coming out of this, which is the dumpster pizza. I don't know where in Oslo it is, but it's, it's basically a, a pizza store where they make all the, the food from, from uh, uh, products that are close to the expiry date. Uh, so th this is basically collaboration between, like we said earlier, tear down the walls between the firms, right? And let the value chains engage with each other. So one man's waste is someone else's input factor. Uh, so I think this is a very good example uh, of how you have to think across organizations along uh, the value chain to make these kinds of things happen. Um, I'm happy that you stopped in there because I was, I, was, I was on the way to talk about something else, but really here, uh, there are large customers here, like the Student Sam Shipnod here, mm -hmm. here in Oslo, uh, the Army for mm -hmm. uh, and other big uh, customers, uh, we have um, uh, Tina uh, and also uh, on the fish, mm. Lerøy, Nortura, uh, Nortura yeah, uh, several actors. And, and also uh, firms in, 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 the, in the middle here, but that's mm. Nortura then, I guess, mm. and, and, and so on. But as you said, working together and, and trying to find new business models that, that uh, with collaboration between parts. And we also see Norske Gjenvinning. Uh, circulation economy, as we've been talking about here, uh, going into the different parts of here, tr collecting uh, uh, garbage and making it into resources mm -hmm. and, uh, and having then a circle here that these resources are returned into uh, new products and... and right, circles. because if I have anything to, to, to complain about in this, this beautiful picture that we borrowed from, from Tipel, it's there should be at least some feedback loop. Perhaps it should be even fully circular. Because what's going on right now is, is basically all over, across industries, you see design of products where the design upfront has the end of use uh, in mind, right? So, so what is going to happen to this cell phone of mine uh, when I stop using it? You know, there's, there was a recent study by some Harvard researchers that shows that when Apple launches a new uh, phone, uh, suddenly, people all over the world start losing their phone to the floor much more often, so it breaks. Then they can buy a new one, right? So, so we have to anticipate what are customers going to do with their phones or with whichever product that is, is they're buying down the line, and how can we design for the reuse? There is actually a phone called Phone Blocks, which you can basically disassemble. You can take out the pieces, and then you can reuse the pieces that are usable and make a new phone. So perhaps 70% of my phone could be reused. You see, I keep mine for a long time because I have gaffer tape. But, but this is a problem, right? Think about the number of appliances stacked up every year when we buy new ones. Do you have gaffer tape on it? Of course. I have gaffer tape on everything. Uh, there's, some, there's some concepts here. And we talk about business model like, like it's, you know, 
known to everyone. Uh, and there are several models now of the business model. We use a simple model here, and we talk about um, the, the, the business model as the story of how the business works, uh, how it creates, delivers, and captures value, and also then, then values from uh, business opportunities. Because in the heart here uh, lies the business opportunities, the problems out there that needs to be solved. Uh, so, uh, in, in the heart of, of every business model, there are some problems and there are some solutions, and there are some products or services uh, that, that uh, are value propositions from the company uh, to the uh, consumers. There's a kind of a hypothesis of, of, of what, the, what the customer needs and, and uh, who the customer are mm. and, and what, what they're willing to, to pay for it. Mm. And the heart of this model is important because, I mean, that's that's where Vurskun Trikar, to say it in Norwegian, that's where, where actually the problems are, right? That's what firms are good at, finding problems that they can solve in a profitable way. And right now, our biggest problem is sustainability. We're not sustainable, not by far. And that means that there's a whole lot of profitability waiting for the firms who can make the solutions to make our lives more sustainable. So there is a vast number of business opportunities associated with either becoming more sustainable or helping others become more sustainable. And we'll return to that. But this is important because this is the heart of the business model. If, if no one feels the shoe press on their feet anywhere, if no one feels a problem, uh, then we can't solve that problem profitably. When we say it's... It's hard. It's hard to make these kinds of, of business models. It's, it's how, to, how to make this story, how to make this business model work, how to, to find those kinds of problems that customers are willing to, to, to pay for, uh, how to deliver them, what kind of resources do you need, what kind of activities do you, do you have to do, uh, what kind of collaborator, collaborators uh, uh, do, you, do you need in order to, to, to deliver that product, from the designing of the product to the pr production of the product, from service, and also now collecting uh, the used product back. Mm -hmm. And you need uh, some kind of logic uh, of how to, to capture value uh, from, uh, from this story. Yeah, and this last part is, is very of often overlooked, even though, of course, all the, the people in the finance departments and so on will be interesting in, interested in what's the profitability logic of this business model. Very often we sort of take that for granted. Well, we sell this product or service and someone pays us and, and that's the end of the story. We just need a good enough margin. But now, in the face of the sharing economy, right, we need a totally different type of, of payment system, not to mention in the, in the circular economy. And also when we think about something like, uh, we now talk about uh, leasing rather than, than uh, buying, right? So uh, why did my parents uh, vacuum, or no, not vacuum cleaner, but the, the tumble dryer, why did it last for, for 25 years while mine only lasts for five, right? There seems to be some sort of shorter lifespan of, of products than, than it used to be. And of course, the incentives of firms is to, to create something that, so you need to buy a new one next year, right? That's what firms need. But if you change the, the capturing logic, the value capturing logic, so for instance, you pay, think about Spotify, you pay a subscription fee to listen to all the music you want rather than pay for, for music and get it in some sort of physical format or, or MP, MP3s, right? Then you can have a different payment system as well. And I think that's also what we will see a whole lot more of. You could easily see me leasing my phone from Apple, for instance. And so, so it's their responsibility to, to sort of supply me as a service firm rather than sell me products again and again and I can stack them up over here uh, when I'm done with it. But it also gives them, an, uh, then Apple, an incentive to, to, to get, get it back. Right. And, and also to, to design it in a way that it's possible to, 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 to take those resources that are valuable, to, to have components of this that, that they can use in new phones. Uh, the same with, with Philips. I you know, listened to them in Barcelona for a couple of weeks ago uh, on the Sustainable Brands Conference, and they, they talk about how they are now transforming the whole company into a circular, circular economy uh, way of thinking of, of it. And, and not only uh, production uh, use, but also take back and reuse and refurbishing uh, those, uh, those uh, appliances. Uh, and, and leasing is, is one way of thinking of it. Not, not anymore uh, selling it, but lease, uh, a leasing model, so they have an incentive to take it back. We talked about innovation. And I mean, innovation can happen at any place here, right? It can happen at the level of, of value creation. We see some new consumer need that wasn't there, or some new way of solving a consumer's problem that we didn't see before. 
there can be innovations in value delivery. And think about what I said with, with CO2, right? If you can get your input factors for free or even have someone pay you to take those resources, uh, it fundamentally uh, changes the way uh, your, your business model functions, and it certainly also influences the profitability logic of that business model. So, so we, uh, there was a question about the business case earlier. I mean, this is basically what we're talking about here. How can you think about innovations that have a clear business case with innovations that start really anywhere in this, uh, in this model. It doesn't always start with a new product as we usually think about innovation as a product innovation or a service innovation or a process innovation. There can be all, all forms of innovation associated with how the business model is, is rigged to create value, basically. So the business model is in, in the middle here. There's a, there's a couple of other symbols as, as well. There's a dollar sign there with a shadow on it, and it's the sunny side. And we talk about the shadowy side and the sunny side of a business, or the bright side of a business. The shadowy side uh, being um, the, the footprint of the organization. It could be CO2, water usage, whatever. Yeah, Mike, Michael said it was 60, 60 liter or so to make a pair of jeans. But that's only in the factory because it takes 8,000 liters of, of, of water to, to make the, the genes from, from production of, of cotton all the way through, uh, to the customer. What Sveidung is wearing has taken up enough water for me to keep alive until this year, 36 years. I'm 36 years old. 36 years of, of drinking water to make that outfit. Right? And, and, and where are you from? That's not a big problem in Bergen. No. Not, not at all, uh, but now uh, th this is produced in areas where it's a shortage of water. Mm. Then it's a real problem. And, and, and companies will also see that uh, the, the water will be priced as a commodity. Mm. We have thought about it as free for a long time, together with water, together with soil, together with everything in the, in the ecosystem. But in, in a short matter of time, water, for instance, in California needs to be imported. And then there's going to be a price on water. It's going to be a price on those peanuts and... and, and, and uh, what, what Cashews and pistachios uh -huh. take they're, up so they're much water exported for some to reason. China. So they, they take water and export it to China. But for how long? How long can they do that? You know? So there's shadow side, and you have to deal with that. So you have to find ways of incorporating that into the, the core of the business model. You have to, to tell that story in a different way. Uh, make products and services that, that helps people to live a more sustainable life. Um, use other kinds of resources. Use less of the resources that you, that you have used uh, in the production, uh, in the transportation and everything. And also find new ways of, of capturing value uh, with less shadow for uh, the, the environment around you. But it's the sunny side as well. Can you right, so, so the sunny side here is basically all the positive side effects generated by your business model, right? So we talked about how the business model of, uh, of a clothing company so, sort of stretches back to cotton production and all of that. Uh, but you, of course, also have a sunny side in the sense that there are positive effects generated by what you offer. So if you, for instance, offer a service that helps people live more sustainable lives, then we should also think about that pos positive footprint right? as, as a, a direct side effect of how your business model is rigged. Mm -hmm. And we see a lot of examples of, of, of firms, of course, who basically address the concern of sustainability through their business model. So their, their whole idea is, is facilitating sustainability uh, on the part of their customers. And there are all sorts of other positive outcomes of business, of course, job creation, taxes, and all of this, which is also should be considered uh, a part of the, the sunny side of, of business. If you we, think about something uh, like the sharing economy. Uh, think about something else, my friend. Uh, time? Uh, it's a sign here with one minute. <laughs> oh, one yeah, minute. yeah. I always just disregard those signs. It's so uh, easy to watch somewhere else. OK, go on, go on. No, no, but I, I was just thinking, uh, where, where should we Yeah, no, end, but go to the end, next oh. slide, right? Go to, go to, the, go to this one, the, the, that one. There are two studies. We're going to do this super quick. We started by saying that our first message, sustainability and profitability, can be aligned. And there are two great studies by scholars at Harvard University, uh, Harvard Business School, published recently uh, in top journals that basically shows that this is true. This is a sample of, of 200 firms approximately in a 20-year period. The red line is the sustainable firms. The blue line are the less sustainable firms. And guess what? The sustainable firms outperform the less sustainable ones over time. But the point is over time. There was a good question earlier on about time horizon. Unilever just stopped having quarterly reports on their financial results because they want to be able to think long term. 
right? So we need to have our eyes on the long term. That are the firms who could address material sustainability concerns. They tackle the real problems. They don't ju just do the things that are visible, that look nice on their website, but they deal with their actual shadow, to use the concepts I know uh, uh, talked about. I'm, I'm, I'm going to end here. And there. Uh, uh, the problem is that people of today have to, 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 to rewrite the stories uh, for tomorrow. So that's why we're here today, and that's, that's what you guys are now going to pick up after us and, and talk about the future and looking into the future, looking at the trends and also how we can transform the businesses today and also the communities of businesses together with the municipalities and, every, and the governments. So uh, this is the challenge, but it's also a possibility. And I'm, I'm, we're looking forward to, to, to listening to you and also being a part of your discussions after lunch. So thank you. Uh, and not goodbye, because uh, we, we're going <laughs> to hang around today. So, right. thank you so much.